41 is... Oh, that's nice. Uh, Jacques Audiard. Oh, that, we're really zigging and zagging, aren't we? Completely, yeah. Can't <laughs> think of a single piece of connective tissue here. Uh, Jack Audiard, he, if I'm getting the right Jack, his most famous movie is Un Prophet. Yes, yeah, he did. Uh, the beat that my heart skipped, Read My Lips, uh, Rust and Bone, of course, was one of his. I remember liking that, despite it having some really rather questionable music choices. <laughs> it was that year when Firework by Katy Perry was just in everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it got in a lot of uh, online scuffles by basically clawing out Unprofit for being horrible. And I, uh, <laughs> most of them with me, I have to say, I really disagree with that. Hello, my name is Rob Simpson and welcome to Directors Uncut. If this is your first episode, we put filmmakers from all genres and all corners of the globe onto a huge list that covers everything from backyard filmmakers to the offspring of cinema titans. Then we turn it into a lottery of directors by using the random number generator to pick a name out of the hat. Whatever name comes out, myself and some guest hosts discuss them and their work through two films. This week it is a cutting from the Patreon archive, so I've been joined by Graham Williamson of Pop Screen, The Gig Show and Horrified. So let's jump into the past of this former Patreon exclusive. It is a French director, mm. but not the one that you'd... Like, when you talk about French cinema, he's not someone who you'd automatically go to first. It is Jack Audiard. Yeah, because... French cinema can be a bit of a prisoner of its heritage, can't it? When you say a French mm. director to someone, they'll go to Troupeau or Carnet faster than they'll go to someone who's alive and working now. But Audiard, I think, deserves the attention. Yeah, it's weird when people think uh, 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 different national cinemas have their uh, stereotypes and French cinema is really a victim to its stereotypes. Yeah. And uh, people who haven't really seen... French cinema, talk about French cinema, the image is kind of like the samurai. Mm, yeah. That's sort of like the stereotype. It's like softly spoken, not a lot of dialogue, the wearing hats. A lot of <laughs> brooding <laughs> stares. They're good at brooding stares of the French. Yeah. But uh, Jack Audiard, he's none of that, really. Mm. Um, two of the films we are talking about today are kind of very much spiritual successes to one another. Mm-hmm. And... Past that, he's worked in the Western genre in America. Um, he's done a prison break. Well, not, he, <laughs> you not didn't break need to break out of the prison in a profit. <laughs> They've got like the door left helpfully ajar at all times. Yeah, I don't like saying this as a, as a slur against him, but it meant something once upon a time. Now it doesn't so much because everybody has their little pigeonhole to stick to. But in the classic. 1940s, 50s sense. He is a journeyman director. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't think... Like William Wellman, he's a, a good one. Um, Someone like Robert Aldrich, I guess, would be relevant to Audiard. Someone who... They have a kind of speciality. They tend to do kind of macho, action-driven stories. But beyond that, it's hard to really pinpoint one thing and say, that's them, that's what they do. Yeah, it's kind of invigorating, really, because, you know, like I said, everybody's trying to be that thing, that mm. one thing, that new this guy, or, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to dig a hole for myself because I'll just start insulting directors. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of Frenchness, it's quite relevant because the reason why Auto TV exists is because the critics in France at that time were looking at those journeyman directors like Aldrich, like Howard Hawks, like Hitchcock, who wasn't always mm. considered, you know, the major True. artist he was, and saying, hang on, there's personal stuff in here. You can, you know, see personal things developed. I don't know whether there's that level... I haven't seen enough Audiard to dig that deep into his themes and mm. in his filmography, but in these two, there's definitely a consistency running through them. Um, yes, I, I would guess. agree. But before that, I think... Uh, What's your sort of experience of him? I've been a fan for a while. Um, I think the only one that I've seen and I haven't quite liked is also a lot of people's favourite one of his, which is the beat that my heart skipped, because 
and I know this is a problem we've both had with different films of his, but I just found Romain Duris' central character too repulsive to even spend time as a disinterested observer with. But a prophet I love, the Sisters Brothers, I thought was cracking, you know. Uh, the bit at my heart escape was the first film of his that I saw, and it's one of those movies mm. where I caught it at the, at the right time. I know it's not related to this episode, but I watched uh, Takashi Miike's Happiness of the Katakuris when it was, what, 17, 18? And it was like, wow, this has blown my mind. Yeah. I came back to it, and I thought, what is this nonsense? <laughs> the, the reason why I brought it up is because at that same sort of age, he also watched a bait that my heart skipped, and I thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. But I don't particularly want to go back to it because I don't think I'm going to think all that much of it again. Yeah, and that's interesting because I, I thought I had seen Read My Lips before, but I must have been mistaking it for one of the other 8 million films where Vincent Cassell plays a sleaze bag. Uh, because when I watched it this time, I I had not seen it. <laughs> he's he's good at what he does. <laughs> yes, he does good slays. Does Vincent Cassell, which by our reckoning makes him a sweetheart. Because Ben Mendelsohn, he is the king of slays, and he's oh, just such boy. a nice guy. Yeah, he's such absolutely. A nice guy. Yeah. Qu'est-ce qui vous arrive? Vous êtes malade? Vous voulez pas vous faire aider? Vous voulez me remplacer? J'évoquais simplement la possibilité d'engager quelqu'un. Ce serait bien qu'il soit gentil. Pas trop grand, avec de belles mains. Vous voulez dire quelqu'un qui présente bien Oui, c'est ça, quelqu'un qui présente bien. Oui, tu t'es fleuri, j'étais euh, à la centrale, quoi. Mais à la centrale de quoi la centrale des particuliers. Je t'entends, là, vous foutez de ma gueule ou quoi, là Bon, yeah, the first movie we talk about, uh, Read My Lips. Do you want to synopsize this fella yeah, it's about a deaf woman who works at an office. Uh, she, it's a very simple story. Uh, she advertises for an assistant. She gives this like really specific list of things she's looking for in an assistant to the job centre, which made me think that a French job centre is just like a dating agency where you can <laughs> say, like, I want someone uh, five foot seven, dark haired but not too dark, you know, a moody romanticism, likes pina coladas and walks in the rain, that sort of thing. Um, And she ends up with an ex-convict played by Vincent Cassell, uh, who is not who she expected at all. But they come up with a a scheme together. Shall we say it's a scheme-based film? And it left me thinking that Jacques Audiard's version of The Office was a bit different to Ricky Gervais's. (laughs) More watchable, though, honestly. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be fair, perfectly fair. Yeah, it, it's interesting as well, you know, because in this one, and with Rust and Bone, you could describe them as social realist. Yeah. Like, the way that it's about sort of the grim reality of the day living. Uh, and this one, it's about the grim reality of a largely deaf woman in a very unforgiving... Uh, Paris, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. But sort of Paris where it's not tourist spots. It's the the sort of Paris you get in movies like Les Miserables, if you, if people never caught that last year, that sort of uh, off the beaten track of Paris. Yeah. But the style that he employs, this is like through his presentation, it's a world away from what social realists usually go for, really, because, one, it has a sense of style, social <laughs> yeah, realism... It doesn't particularly jam that jam. Mm. <laughs> but in the presentation of the, the deafness, I thought it was a real neat trick, you know, uh, turning off her hearing aid so the audio goes out of whack when it's too quiet, the loud audio is too... No, I mean, the, the hearing aid's too loud and the audio comes through too loud. It has this sort of sense of disorientation about the way it's presented. And I really, really, really like that, you know. Yeah, I think the the main strength of the film is that this central character played by Emmanuel Devos, you, you are really in her shoes from square one and Odia pulls out every directorial trick he can to make sure that you know what limitations she's having to overcome. I do think that is a very strong uh, piece of work in general. Did a bit of reading around it and apparently between his first film and this there was a six year where like uh, were they off really mm. I'd love to see that, that second film that's a self made hero isn't it that looks yeah. fascinating I don't know what would cause that six month layoff but he really had the time to consider like the attention to detail in this yeah I think he did I think when he's, he was on downtime I think he did some work as a screenwriter for other directors 
Which I think shows, because although his films are stylish and they are cinematic, they are also very writerly pieces. They are good yarns in the classic sense, I think. Oh yeah, he's he's fantastic at characterisation and making these feel like real people. Mm. Which kind of leads to the sort of weird dynamic that the group, the two have. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not... It's kind of a romantic thriller. It kind of has that kind of film noir, fatalistic romance element to it. But it also, as you say, has that social realist element pushing up against it. And you know that in real life, someone like Vincent Cassell's character isn't going to be like a smooth Kirk Douglas type. He's more (laughs) likely to be a a right bastard. And indeed, sometimes he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he, they've got the best actor there for it, not implying that Vincent Cassell is. But, you know. but, he, but he's good at it, yes. Yeah, yeah, he is. And the sort of relationship, how they sort of complete each other, and in saying it like that, it makes it sound like... Um, Jerry Maguire. It, yeah, this is, <laughs> you had me at hello. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Jerry That's Maguire? Jerry Maguire, yeah. <laughs> Nothing like that. It's just with her being deaf, she lacks, well, largely deaf, she lacks a lot of things in the world. Mm. But uh, it's created her personality in her, which apparently she won like awards for this, beating out an like, amazing competition. I can't remember the name of the French. They call them the French Oscars. but the that's Caesars. Fair. That's Caesar. That's really condescending as a title, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the French Caesars, leave it at that. Mm. complicated things. But she has done some really good competition because uh, despite it being a social realist adjacent film, we'll call it, mm. uh, despite her being deaf and being quite um, not bitter about it, but she's harboured a massive amount of resentment. Yeah, and you see where that comes from. You know, people yeah. do treat her appallingly. So when this character comes along, Vincent Cassell, who's a bit of a shit... <laughs> Yeah, you know it's this perfect opportunity for the two of them to sort of use each other, mm. but not. So it's kind of like they complete each other. It, it, you know, it is sort of romantic style in some ways, but the other in the other ways, um, it's not entirely. Yeah, that either uh, they complete each other in a really sleazy way. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the differences between this and a classic noir too is that classic noirs tend to have this more Hollywood kind of way of getting the plot together where something will happen in an emblematic moment. If you've got two characters who have to get together, you need that shot of, you know, Fred McMurray looking up while Barbara Stanwyck's legs come down the stairs. Uh, The rest of her also came down the stairs, by the way, if you haven't seen Double Indemnity. It wasn't, you know, just them, but... um, Yeah. And and Read My Lips doesn't do that. It staggers those big plot beats. So you get to see the characters both move towards each other and move towards crime in like little twists of the knife, which makes it feel more real, but also makes it feel more tense, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, jumping off in in another film. There was a movie a few years ago, a German film. It was uh, purported to be taken in one shot. Uh, Victoria, I think it was called. Oh, yeah, yeah. That had a, a sense of realism to it, and because of that realism, the turn to crime feels more tense, like you say, uh, more stakes to it, really. Yeah. Because this, this does turn to crime. I don't want to give it away too much, but it's kind of a perfectly realised storm, I guess, um, how mm. the taste couldn't be completed about both of them using their, uh, in the terms of heist movies, using their specialist skills. Yes. Vincent Cassell has a very particular set of skills, which includes playing good sleazebags and helping deaf women. Yeah, and the the whole idea of her being able to lip read plays a a huge role. Hence the title, I'll read my lips, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's got its problems. I think... When the situ, maybe it is that social realist mood that you pinpointed, but when the situation becomes a bit more grave, it doesn't register as strongly as it could do because the mood is already pretty fatalistic from the start. I don't know how much that affects things, but it felt like more of a problem than it would be in a similarly themed 40s or 50s crime film. Well, yeah, there is that to it, but honestly, I preferred it to uh, this wave of British movies in particular, um, which it's car geezer crime movies, 
mm. lots of swearing, uh, but it's presented sort of in a very realistic way. I've never um, thought about that. Yeah, this this was made in 2001, so it is right in the middle of that awful wave of Guy Ritchie-influenced geezer crime films, and it's staggeringly far ahead in any way you choose. And more, enjo- and more enjoyable than those too, because uh, mm. even as, as unlikable as the both of them can be, um, they can be appreciated on a performance level, because both of them are excellent. Vincent Cassell could, like, you know, do anything and I'd be happy to watch it. Uh, and the female lead, too, is a bit of a... I don't know whether she's a star or a named actor in France, but she made an impression on me. I enjoyed her performance a great deal. Yeah, let me just look... Whereas facts. in those Giza movies, it's it's basically, yeah. Those Giza movies are basically an interchanging cast of guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's that, too. They're all just angry at each other and all swearing and they've all got skinheads and it's just... Uh, yes. Yeah. Danny Dyer escaped that world and became an actor on EastEnders kind of tells you of the calibre of acting in those movies. <laughs> yeah. Um, she still does a bit, Emmanuel Devos. I'm just looking her up now. She's been in a few sort of fairly notable stuff, things like I mean, uh, Frank and Lawler with Michael Shannon... Uh, but mm. yeah, maybe maybe not taken off as a lead in the way you would expect from from this. Oh, yeah, it's a pity really because it is a start of turn. Mm. So I mean, to go back to the the, the this has been called the French Oscars. If this was an Oscar nominated movie, yeah, American piece, which I, I read a lot of uh, reviews from the time, and they said this is basically ready for a remake. Mm. And thankfully, I don't think it actually happened, did it? it never did. No. Yeah. Which, which is good, but yeah, um, if it was an American movie, that lead actress would have been hurtling towards the stars. Completely, yeah. But I think she does all right. She seems to have uh, worked with a pretty impressive set of directors. Uh, Alan Resney, Emmanuel Karev, um, you know, some interesting people. Hmm, yeah. And Vincent Cassell, basically. This is pretty early on in his career, isn't it? Yeah, he was um, what, still doing Lahane. those sort of angry young man roles that he had in the aftermath of Lahaine at this point. So this is kind of, even though it's similar kind of crime territory, it feels like a step up into a more mature kind of film. It is, yeah. yeah, And it's also a very good calling card for a director as well, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Because this was the first I heard of him, of uh, Jack René. No, Jack Odiad, sorry. Get my, my Jack's mixed up. <laughs> Yeah, it was the first I'd ever heard of him as well uh, when I saw this reviewed, and I guess that is a fair old jumping off point so we can see what he did next later on, right? Well, there was a considerable gap, but yeah, yeah. how he evolved with a similar sort of unconventional romance story, mm. I think we'll call it loosely. Yeah. But I, I quite liked it, you know, of the two. I think I preferred this, to be honest. Okay, um, okay. Because it's new. It's new, and you know it, it. It jives a bit more with genres that I like. You know, I do enjoy a good heist movie, and that's hard to say. I know it eventually eventually becomes a heist movie, but mm. yeah, with heist movies now, it's not really that done a thing. And if you have a, a sort of a, a taste or a desire to watch one, it's basically oceans insert number here, and that, <laughs> yeah. there's not much else really going on. So yeah, to see one that I haven't seen before, you know. It was kind of like uh, the first time I saw Brothers Bloom. It's like, wow, that's just what the doctor ordered, really. You don't make those things anymore. And this ticked that, uh, satisfied that same sort of thing, really. Excellent. I think I like the second one we'll be reviewing better, but we will get to that. I do think there are signs of early roughness around the edges. I don't think it's as stylistically confident as some of his later films, but it does have those two absolute knockout lead performances that help it get through some of its rougher patches. I mean, I've been watching a lot of 1970s New York scuzploitation, so maybe I'm a bit more open to, to rawness. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Sheets. We got the sheets and the mattress. Yeah, okay, let's put it all together. Let's think. Add it up. Add it up. What do we got? What do we got? What are you doing? S- stop! Stop! What Shh. are you doing? Shh. Shh. Hold this for me. No, no, that's your shirt. You hold it. Uh, 
I like your energy, but I'm not, I'm not with you. Where when the shirt gets wet, it doesn't break. I don't know what that means. And then... Okay, and then what? Then with the wet shirt, you, you bend the bars. That's the payoff. Don't waste my time with stuff like that, okay? A 2,000-year-old civilization, that's all you can come up with? Shame on you. Shame on you. <laughs> come on, stop, please. It's embarrassing. See, I told you so. No, you said wet shirt don't break, not piss shirt bend bar. So wait, they're gonna do this podcast in in seasons. Um, the first season is going to well, the beginning and the end of the first season is going to be signalled by a fast upload frenzy, weekly upload frenzy of all the podcasts like this one that originally started life on. Patreon. So this should bring us to about May ish when the when the season ends. So yeah, plenty to look forward to there. And if you have enjoyed this episode so far, please do consider subscribing wherever you get your podcasts from. And um, also to keep up to date with all of the things uh, directors uncut related, follow me on Twitter at underscore R J Simpson. Or on Instagram at Directors Uncut Pod to keep up to date with new episode announcements and a little bit and little bits of news and and this and that. Um, and if you've got a few minutes to spare, give the show a rating or review on Apple Podcasts if you've got an iPhone or anything like that. Or if you you're one of us one of us plebs who don't have an iPhone, um, you can give the show a rating on Spotify. I think what you need to do on Spotify is you need to have listened to half an hour of said podcast. Um, then there's three dots, you click on that and it gives you an opportunity to give a, a podcast a star rating. So, five stars please. Five stars please. Yes please. Um, if you can't do either of those things, However, sharing is caring. Give the podcast a share on social media. It allows new eyes and ears to discover us. And that is essentially the most important thing here. All of those things, whether you're giving a review on Apple or a rating on Spotify or sharing it on social media, that is the game. Sharing the podcast, getting it out there into the world. So let's jump into the back half. So to be honest. Ça fonctionne encore Ouais. Non, je sais pas. C'est différent. Sur une fois, c'est dur de dire. Bah, mais là, il faut... je peux pas, il faut que j'y aille. Mais non, c'est pas du tout ce que je voulais dire. Ah. C'est nouveau, quoi. Alors. Euh... Mais c'était bien ou pas Oui, oui, c'était bien. Bah, quand t'as envie et que t'as personne, tu me demandes. Et si je suis OP, on y va. Ça veut dire quoi, OP Bah, opérationnel. Quand je suis dispo, quand je peux, quoi. Quand t'es opé, on... Bah ouais. Shall we go on to our second Jacques Audiard film? Yes. Um, this is Rust and Bone. Mm. Um, which I guess you could describe as his international breakthrough. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one stars. Oh, I'm always bad with names. Matthias Schoenart and. Come on, Tim. You can do it. I, I believe Tim in me you. Tongue. I could say. Marion Cotillard. Let's yes. go, Marion Cotillard. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias Schoenart, um He. Oh, God. Uh, imagine a stereotype for the worst gym bro imaginable. <laughs> the one who watches MMA videos on his phone and he's really obnoxious and he's sleeping around. That guy. At him. Yeah. He's effectively the bone of the title. Hmm. Marion Cotillard is she works at the local I guess it's Sea Life's World or well, it's, on the, it's the like it, it's shows. obviously meant to be Sea World, but they obviously can't say that for reasons that become very clear. Yeah, and in a show with a variety of orcas, um she has an accident. Uh, essentially she Loses one leg, is it? Or does she lose both? Both. Yeah, both. I think it's both, isn't it? Yeah. 
And she effectively, what the person who she once was, who liked to go out dancing, she was in a very, very social public face and job becomes an incredible recluse um, and doesn't want to go outside. And through contrivance of them meeting one night at a gig of Matai Shonas when he's basically uh, doing a night uh, nightclub gig thing. He's a bouncer. There's a fight. Yeah. yeah. They become interconnected. And throughout the entirety of the movie, their connection sort of pops and fizzles and goes in weird directions. Um, I think that's essentially the plot. And there's, uh, Matai Shonas has a kid, a five-year-old kid. Mm. And yeah, it's kind of quite episodic as in there's not a real plot, it's just the bubbling tension of a relationship with people who really shouldn't be together. Yeah, uh, it was adapted from two short stories by a writer, a Canadian writer called Craig Davidson. Uh, one of them was called Rust and Bone, one of them was called Rocket Ride. And Rust and Bone is essentially a whole story about the Matthias Schoenart's character, the MMA fighter. And Rocket Ride was about a, a male uh, SeaWorld trainer who lost his legs in an accident. But Odiard's idea was that they could hybridise these stories by making the character a woman and making it about their relationship. And I'd forgotten. This is one of the ways that, like I say, I watched this when I was out at the cinema. I'd, I'd forgotten that we are introduced to this whole situation through Matthias Schoenart's eyes. I'd filed it away in my head as this is Jacques Audiard's movie about women, you know, because most of his films are intensely testosterone-y. Uh, and this is, I guess, slightly less so. It's not exactly a woman's story, but the dial has been turned down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes to the core of what I think's best to it. I think it's at its best when it's telling the story of uh, Cotillard, I'll be honest. Maybe it's because of his back, uh, his history with with incredibly masculine movies, but just the story that's being told there of a woman trying to find herself again mm. after being completely destroyed. I think, uh, as well as the performance that she gives, yeah, it's much more relatable and much more intense a drama, really, in that aspect of it. Yeah, I, th- I think it is telling that when I was thinking back to it. The bits that I remembered from seeing it at the cinema were all centred on Courtyard's character. I think that means something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with Courtyard, you get the the bad music as well because <laughs> holy moly! Can we take a second to talk about how weird Jack Courtyard's needle drops are? Because I filed it away in my head as just something that happens in Rust and Bone, but there were incredibly odd musical selections in Read My Lips as well. Charts and graphs by Grandaddy plays at one point. <laughs> I couldn't explain it really. I mean, if I was going, if I, it was me making this movie, I, I think you know what we've got a lot of lay music. It's French. Let's use that. But no, yep. we get Katy Perry and fireworks as a big dramatic number. <laughs> and I can sort of, I, I kind of understand that because when you first hear it, it's at one of her like SeaWorld shows. And I can imagine that being the kind of music that gets played at SeaWorld. I've never been, yeah. but I imagine that's it. And then later on, it gets played in a more emotional context, which, again, is either going to work for you or not. The maddest needle drop in here is when Matthias Schoenart is out jogging and the the track he has on to pump him up and get him running for the finish line is evidently Chicken Town by John Cooper Clark. Is that who that was? Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's... When it, he, he's running over a bridge as he's going out for a jog, and it, as he comes over the bridge, it's kind of out of focus. The music, it's like really low down in the mix, and as closer it comes to the camera, the more you hear it. And as it was starting, is this some sort of French hip hop? Yeah. <laughs> it's not one of the bits of evidently Chicken Town that everyone remembers, which is basically the really sweary bits that Christopher Eccleston recites in uh, Danny Boyle's film Strumpet, but. It, it is still just, I, the, I, I, I prepared myself for the Katy Perry, but I was not ready for the John Cooper Clark. It gives it a personality, I guess. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think the thing is with Shonert's character is we, we are going to talk a lot when we talk about Odiard about the kind of dickhead line 
with his male characters. Like, uh, what side of the dickhead line does this fall? And even though Ali, the Matai Shonard's character, is, is a bad guy, and he's someone who I would not want to spend time with, I think there is a level of perspective on his character and a level where we can see him through Stephanie's eyes that makes him not nicer, but easier to spend time with. I mean, to a degree, yeah, but it plays weirdly now. Mm. You know, what with the way that society has evolved and the way people treat people is under much greater scrutiny than it has been in previous decades. Um, there's a scene, a dramatic scene, in which... Uh, Cotillard sort of confronts Sean Art and says, what am I to you? Mm. And that scene, because he goes around basically, he has this line of when he's he's ready for sex, he basically says, I'm OP, I'm operational. It's like, <laughs> really? Wow. Okay, say romance is dead. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, Cotillard says, what am I to you? Uh, a friend, a pal, an easy lay, you know, and mm. it's just... That scene hits really weirdly now, uh, in a way which is much different than I think it was ever intended. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember a lot of the talk when it came out being about how sort of inspiring Cote Yard's character was and what a great role for a woman is. But maybe it's just because the bar for like a really heroic female character has now been raised to actually a superhero by recent films yeah. you look at her and you think oh she's she's really broken and she can really do a lot better for herself oh yeah yeah because he's horrible really mm. like um he there's scenes like a few scenes throughout it where he says like hello a woman and it jump cuts to them basically rutting like animals in an alleyway yeah, um, and he's phoned at one one of these uh, instances. He's phoned from the school. Says, uh, "Your kid's been waiting here. Are you going to pick him up?" Mm. And he answers the phone while rutting in this alleyway. He's just, ooh, <laughs> he's an absolute <laughs> sleaze bag. But I feel like compared to the beat that my heart skipped at, I spent a lot of that film thinking, "What level are we meant to take this character as?" And when you see like someone having sex in a back alley with someone they don't know and being phoned by their school to say they've left their kid by the school gates, you know that the movie has a perspective on him. You know that the movie is very aware that this isn't a decent person. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is true. And it's one of these performances... uh, I told people off on the internet for saying um, just because you don't like the characters in a movie doesn't make it bad. Yeah. But in this case... I don't think it's it's that especially. Um, it's I'm so distracted by the fact that I genuinely, genuinely dislike this character that it took me a good while to realise that it was actually an excellent performance. Yeah, because Sean Arts is a good actor, but his he gets cast in some strange roles. I find. I mean, obviously now he's a European actor in Hollywood, so he gets cast in roles where he has to turn up for five minutes and glower at the hero. But even before that, I mean, he'd just come off the back yeah. of uh, that. I can't remember who directed that film, Bullhead, the Belgian film. Yeah, it was a Belgian film. It got, it got a lot of uh, plaudits, but it's very vague in my memory now. It's a Belgian film. It got a lot of plaudits, and I hated it. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Uh, but I will I will say this. He is very good in it. And there's an early scene where uh, Ali is asked what his previous experience was, and he says something about working with like at a farm or something. And that I wondered whether that was a call out to Bullhead. But I think... One of the things that Odiard has that uh, the director of Bullhead... I should look him up, but I can't be bothered. One of the things that Odiard has that Sir Henry Bullhead uh, doesn't have is that his his metaphors are just less on the nose, I think. I think that's a crucial bit. It's like the centre of Rust and Bone is this big weird event where someone gets their legs bitten off by an orc and you think that that is quite an odd thing to happen in a sensitive character drama. But it never pushes that as a thing that means something. It's just a thing that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just tragic mm. circumstances. Yeah. But that scene, the way it's shot as well, that, that orca leg scene. Yeah. Um, you don't see any of it uh, 
there's little bits where she's just getting ready. She's doing like the hand up and the doing a bit of a jump, the arcas. But when it comes to the actual event, it cuts to the bottom of the pool and you just see sort of the absolute chaos. Hmm. And then eventually, Katya just sort of plops into the water. Yeah. It's very tastefully done. And I think in general, it's a more stylistically interesting film than than Read My Lips All, than The Beat That My Heart Skipped. I think he's really evolved as a stylist. It has this opening of like mixed characters' memories mixed in with abstract footage of the water, which is almost like a Stan Brackage film. It's very abstract and sensory, and I don't think he would have done that in his earlier films. No, I mean, to go back to what I said about Rust and no, uh, Read My Lips, this too has a sort of adjacent Euro social realist uh, flavour to it. Mm. But it has these little uh, instances like that scene with the Orca and little bits here and there throughout it, which ha- there's a, a stylist at play. Mm. Some of his editing choices are neat and, and weird. Like his use of jump cuts, which I've suggested there. I don't know whether he uses them as gags, really, but I, not funny gags, more like sight gags. Yeah, yeah, gags, I know what you mean. Really. There's a kind of dramatic irony to them, even if they're not funny. funny. Mm. Yeah. No, because I don't think there's any funny in this, really. It's it's quite horrible. I mean, the way like, Sean Atts treats his poor little kid. Oh. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to spoil this for anyone who hasn't seen it. But towards the end, there is a big like dramatic situation that is dropped in in the last 15 minutes and how did that land for you before that whole sequence where it's kind of an unearned uh, redemption arc for him i think Mm -hmm. but that being so i think the way it's directed and the way it's acted uh kind of paper over that a little bit so it wasn't quite as emotional as the first time i watched it but the second time I kind of processed it for what was happening rather than the emotions of, of the situation. And yeah, it's it's well done. But again, I think that redemption that he receives is kind of unearned. It's one of those things where I watched it and I, I liked it. I thought it was good. And I was also very aware that maybe very few other directors would really get away with doing this. It, it is very dicey, structurally speaking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw it, this was like one of my favourite films. I think it was of uh, 2012. Yeah, and 2012 was a great year. Can we sort of canonise 2012 as a great year for cinema? Because that was the year we had this. Uh, We had The Master, we had Coriolanus, we had Skyfall, we had Holy Motors. We had, I mean, tons of stuff, great stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a classic, yeah. I totally forgot about The Master because, you know, in a filmography of him, uh, Paul yeah. Thomas Anderson, just everything's a masterpiece. <laughs> never <laughs> ask hard, me. Yeah. Never ask me to rate my favourite Paul Thomas Anderson films. Yeah, but I bet you there's about a hundred lists on Letterbox which try to do it, and it's just a fool's errand, really. Yeah, it's the long lost thirteenth labour of Hercules. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I really like this. Um, it's there's a clear escalation of filmmaking talent. Mm. He he's grown immensely how he can essentially tell the same story of two people who complete each other. Yeah. But there's more shades of grey to it, I think, than there was previously. And just stylistically, the shots he uses, the editing techniques, Mm -hmm. it's really interesting as an exercise because you don't often get the chance to compare a director because they're often chasing the sunset and changing who they are. So when you get a consistent theme from beginning of his career to Mid career, yeah, whatever you want to characterize it as, it's really interesting as sort of a an exercise. I think, yeah, I completely agree, and I'm pleased to see that for his next film, Paris Thirteenth District, he's going back to romance. He's doing another romantic story. Uh, this time, I'm excited to say with script by Celine Sciamma of um, yeah, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Yes. And I'm very excited by that because as my life as a courgette shows, even Celine Seema's for higher work as a scriptwriter for other directors is pretty damn good. I really need to see her movie because uh, her new movie's got a lot of uh, plaudits on the uh, festival scene. And yeah. also, I think it's the lead actor, uh, one of the two. She's in a movie which is just sort of on the scene, the festival on the VOD scene right now called Jumbo. 
in which she falls in love, literally falls in love, romantic love with a roller coaster. Yes, I've heard about that. And Norman Milan, who is also uh, the woman, who, the, the lady who was on fire in Portrait of a Lady on Fire. So, yeah, really pleased to see them sort of working <laughs> together again. And it's also got Jenny Beth from Savages in it, which means that I will have to have an episode of Pop Screen dedicated to this at some point. Oh, I, my heart was racing there when you said Savages, because that word... I, t- I think it was a 2012 movie as well. Um, I can't remember who directed it, one of the old firms. Oliver Savage, Stone. Oh, yeah, that was a bad movie. Uh, I do uh, think uh, it was 2012 <laughs> as well. But <laughs> 2012, it's not all great. <laughs> I don't, has he done anything since then, Oliver Stone? I don't think he has, has he? He's done... Um, he's done some of those, like, TV things he does where he meets... Vladimir Putin or someone and acts as their proctologist for a bit, you know, just crawls up their ass. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think he's done any sort of film films for cinema release. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, he's a director that I'm always interested in, Jack Audiard. Um, hmm. he's, he's got a clear sense of style. And also, just jump into his most... His American movie, uh, The Sisters Brothers, he has a really shrewd sense of humour that I never knew he had in him. Yeah, I really enjoyed Sisters Brothers. And if you haven't seen it and looking at its box office, a lot of people haven't seen it. Listeners, you should absolutely make time for that because it's a cracking film. <sighs> yeah, because it's got a relationship dynamic, a brother relationship between... Oh, here we go, remembering actors' names again. <laughs> Shall I do it? Shall I jump in? Yeah, I, think, I think it's quicker if you do it rather than um, umming and ahhing. <laughs> John C. Riley and Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, because there's a scene in that where uh, John C. Riley says, you embarrassed me in front of the state, in, just in the middle of the street. Mm. You made a, a, an absolute mock of me, mockery of me. Joaquin Phoenix says, okay, so hit me back. Hit me back. <laughs> yeah. Just hit me back. Get your revenge. And he absolutely levers him. <laughs> and the look on Whacking Phoenix's face, it's like, oh my God, you hit me. <laughs> and it's such a well-played scene with two actors who... And it's always a worry, you know, when it, especially French directors who make their English language debut, that's been a bit of a poison chalice the past yes. decade or so, but Odiad made it look kind of easy. It's a really good film, and I like that even though, uh, to take it back to what I was talking about Rust and Bone, even though it is a guy movie about guys, and it's a western, which is one of the guysiest of genres, there are all these lovely, precise little one-scene cameos for brilliant actresses. You've got Carol Kane, Rebecca Root, Alison Tolman. It's such a good cast. Such a good cast. Oh, yeah. It completely deserves a re- well, another look at it from a lot mm. of people. Oh, first look at it from yeah. anybody, really. <laughs> right, to wrap up this week's podcast, to wrap up the Jack Audiard podcast, um, usually at this point of the show, we talk about movies that we'd seen elsewhere. But seeing as though this episode, this original episode with me and Graham, was from, ooh, I don't know, March 2021? The touchstones, the things we're talking about are going to be out of date. Of course, not everything is going to, that's not going to be true of everything, but most things. So instead, we're going to hand over to myself, Ariel from Ghouls Magazine and James, aka Reviewing Rodders, to talk about what things we've been watching. Also, this is a cutting from the upcoming Jackie Chan episode, which is a Patreon exclusive too. So it's a Patreon freebie, essentially. A little bit of a, a hook to get you on on that Patreon, to get on our Patreon. So let's jump over to Lords 3, myself, Ariel and James, shall we? So a final part of the show, um, movies or TV shows or whatever that either of you have been watching um, away from podcasting, or maybe even part of podcasting, another podcast that you want to plug it, uh, that you'd like to talk about here. Just complete free reign to talk about whatever movies or TV you want. Anyone want to go first? I've had a bit of a polar opposite, um, because I went to the cinema to watch the first two Godfather films, and at home I've been watching the Jackass films. (laughs) <laughs> okay that's a good balance there hmm. i love them both to be fair uh, yeah surprisingly enough the godfather films live up to all that good stuff people have been said about them 
Who knew? And um, yeah, going on about Jackie Chan and his stunts, it feels like Johnny Knoxville and his crew are not are in a similar boat because all the stuff they put their bodies through for the sake of entertainment and pushing themselves is oh makes me crumple up inside and just not want to watch but it's too fascinating uh could you explain that to me really i mean i don't get jackass i saw the first one back in Mm. when i was younger and i wouldn't like to say how old i was um (laughs) and i loved it but when i've watched it older than that i'm just perplexed honestly i just don't get it um to be fair the first one does feel like they just gone from the tv show to like oh we got a film how do we make a film and the second yeah. one i is genuinely one of my favorite comedies it feels like comedy okay yeah uh, yeah it makes me laugh so um i i don't really know how to explain it i just it's partly them putting their bodies through all this for audience entertainment but also some of it feels like they're making they're making a commentary on it because there's one where what I I can't remember who is Bam I think he gets as a stunt branded like you do a bull and it is gruesome but also <laughs> while you while you're putting through that you think this is what animals go through that's inhumane and so that's a nice little well I say nice but it is a bit of Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I just thought it was a nice little know. bit on top of it. I really like that. Mm. Um, I think that's a good thing to think about when you're watching a person getting branded. It is a nice stance because usually, I mean, I, I don't know whether you call it a meme, but that quote from The Simpsons where uh, Skinner says, am I wrong? Oh, the kid's wrong. He says, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's the kids. They're definitely wrong. And that's what it feels like with Jackass. Well, for me, anyway, from my perspective. Mm. Oh, uh, comedy subjective, I suppose, but oh, it, it just makes me laugh. And there's another one I have to mention called Terror Taxi, which initially it seems like, what the fuck are you doing? Where they get someone to dress up in a stereotypical idea of a terrorist in the 2000s, have him go into a taxi and act like that to kind of scare the driver. But what they don't know, is, what the person doing the stunt doesn't know, is the driver, they've hired, they've hired someone to do it, They've gotten someone who I think would have at the time been on the receiving end of those awful stereotypes and judgments mm. and just have him play a part and think, oh, you're doing this shit. Well, I'm going to kidnap you of. It feels like as much commenting on, oh, you want to go think this racist stuff is good. This is and actually acts out some kind of a punishment almost for that kind mm. of prejudice way of thinking. And It's elaborate. It's one of the most sadistic things I've seen. And there's layers of sadism to what they do to that person who's enacting the stunt. But Mm. I'm so enthralled in how it just feels like a descent into hell for this one person. Uh, Fascinating. I think you you and Extreme Horror are made for one one another (laughs) with uh, analysis like that. Um, Not going to lie. I spent one day where I just, with a mate, we we just thought, let's double bill a Serbian film and Irreversible. And oh, that's a horrible day. <laughs> yeah, that Terror Taxi stunt affected me more than those two films, which... Oh, wow. Yeah. I could see that, though, because there's, for me, there's always mm-hmm. going to be a difference between watching something fictional and something real. Yeah. I can watch a lot that's fictional i don't want to say anything but i'll say a lot Mm. and as soon as things get real i freak out very quickly so Mm. i actually kind of get where you're coming from with that i'm exactly the same i i'll watch any not any because there's a limit to what is put on screen but within limits i'll watch most things but if there's say like a tv documentary series about 24 hours on a and and it's just too real and i become Mm. like a six-year-old boy hiding behind the sofa it's it's bizarre, yeah. really. Mm, agreed. Um, so, uh, Ariel, anything that you've been watching recently that you like to, to draw focus to? Sure. Um, well, Glasgow Fright Fest just wrapped up, and so I was watching a couple of screeners for that. Um, I watched an incredible vampire comedy called Let the Wrong One In, and 
it's so sweet and heartfelt and enjoyable and hilarious. And, you know, horror comedy can really be kind of hit or miss. Sometimes it's not scary enough and not funny enough, but like the comedic timing in Let the Wrong One In and the editing and the smart use of their their low budget, it's just an like excellently put together independent film. So I'm really excited for people to see that. Um, and I also watched a movie called The Ledge, which was not as good. Um, <laughs> it's it's meant to be like a survival thriller, but it's the writing. Have you seen The Room? You know how The Room takes itself really seriously, but it's very yeah. funny? Mm-hmm. It's it's not as funny as The Room, but it's kind of that feeling where they, you know they were taking it seriously, but it's just not landing at all. Um, and, you know, mostly my wheelhouse is horror. And so you can find me podcasting and writing about horror on different parts of the internet. And I just finished rewatching all of the Saw films recently, which is where my heart lives. I, I've, and, got to say, I've not seen a single one. Okay. I won't not spoil bad. them for you. Um, I don't know why. I've just it's just one of those things that I never really got around to. Just haven't got I haven't gotten around to tons of movies that other people are like, how have you never seen this? It's just one of those yeah. things. You only have so much time in a day. Um, but I'm doing a deep dive. We just finished recording on the Fishnuts and Philosophy podcast, where we are going into each movie in depth and talking about um, themes of like morality and justice and parenthood and. Um, masculinity and how all that was portrayed in the 2000s. So I've been doing a lot of horror deep dives lately. So it was actually like really wonderful to just talk some Jackie Chan a little bit today. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you can say this, but is there a one saw movie which any, well, every horror fan should see? Because I know it kind of became like uh, basically like a Saturday morning cartoon, but in sort of grisly violence. The scale of it's grisly violence, but there's got to be one pure example where this is the one where this is the concept. This is where I, it was just knock it out of the park. I mean, I gotta recommend the original, mm. and yeah. I love the whole series, but it does get really far away from where it came, which often happens with you know franchises of all kinds. Yeah. Um, the first movie is very pretty simple, straightforward, and you're spending a lot of time with a couple characters, whether you like them or not, and the rest of the franchise has its ups and downs. But in addition to the grisly violence, which there is a lot of, there's also quite a bit of plot, a lot more plot in those films than people realize. And there's a lot of twists and turns and, and like who done it and mm-hmm. cat and mouse. And so if you want to just turn your brain off and watch some splatter, they have that for you. But if you want to like get stuck into a whodunit cop drama, Saw is there for you as well. Um, but yeah, if you were just going to watch one, I would say watch the first one. If mm. if you would like to. I, you know, if you don't want to, then don't. <laughs> well, it, it, it kind of fell when I was at my, my sort of, uh, I don't want to say pretentious movie fan fears, but my pretentious movie fan fears. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was better than it, honestly. And it's just sure. sort of skip because it came with that. It, it's such a horrible term, but it's the one which is stuck. But touch upon it, it mm. kind of is riding the crest of that. And some of the stuff like the hostile movies was genuinely just ugly. And I guess I kind of personally just tied the entire subgenre with that that ugliness, really. Mm. Yeah, that's it understandable. It, I mean, I I I'm glad to hear you say that because I do think, particularly the first Saw is definitely not torture porn. And I'm saying that as a fan of torture porn. I don't think that's a bad phrase at all, but the first Saw isn't that. It's a lot more of a cop drama. And so it does kind of bum me out when people are like, oh, I don't want to get into all that torture porn stuff. I'm like, I promise you the first Saw is not that. Um, And I think Hostel 2 is legitimately great. But the first one, I don't care for that much. Um, And just to go on record, uh, French extremism is far nastier than than torture porn. French extremism is really, really horrible Mm. in some of its uh, movies. But I think the reason, and I I like French extremity too, I think torture porn gets more punched down on by horror fans because usually French extremity has something to say. And so it's their movies about violence more than they are violent movies oftentimes. Whereas torture porn, 
doesn't always have something to say. And I'm saying that as a fan of all of it, so I, I get to say it. Um, but I do think even though they were happening at similar times, they had really different things behind them. Okay. I think it, deserve, it deserves a shot, at the very least. I think you've swung me over there. <laughs> uh, let me be your ambassador through through any Saw movie that you want to watch. I, I'm here for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was equally dubious about uh, found footage, and hmm. the few which people champion really uh, swung me on that one too. Cause you, you can't judge a genre by its worst examples. That's just not fair. That's very true. That's Ooh. very true. And there's a lot of really bad found footage movies. Let's just have that yes. on record. <laughs> there are. There are. And there's a lot of great ones. But mm. yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of not great ones, especially yeah. on streaming. Yeah, I've become <laughs> evangelical about Lake Mungo. I'll, I'll chew anybody's oh. ear off about that one. Mm. Lake Mungo is amazing. Yeah. Wreck is my one of choice. Oh, Wreck is so good. I've, yeah, I've got that on Blu-ray. I've had it for years, but I just haven't got around to it. <laughs> just, Honestly, I'm, 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 it's... It's really damn good. I think it's only like seventy odd minutes as as well. So it's an well, efficient film. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. you've given me a perfect segue there to talk about uh, one of the movies that I've been watching, which has been compared to One Cut of the Dead a lot. Mm. Where beyond the infinite two minutes. Oh, yes, that's on my list. I need to see that. The concept is a weird one. Um, we're in a Japanese cafe. I think it was. Well, it doesn't matter about the city. That's a, a really unimportant aspect. But the owner of the cafe goes upstairs. Uh, he looks at his monitor, and there's a version of him s- s- stood there talking to him. That version is from two minutes in the future. So there's this loop which has been created in the, between these this monitor and this TV, which is a two minute time loop. So it's kind of it's one of these mechanically weird movies, which is incredibly impressive. I mean, they've got like a bit in the outro over the uh, credits where it shows you how it was filmed, but I still don't know how it was filmed because it's got like t- one, two, three, four, five versions of the same people interacting with each other through these monitors. Mm-hmm. And it's bewildering. It's honest to, honest to God, genuinely, marvellously inventive sort of low-budget filmmaking. And it's just so sweet and charming about it too. I mean, usually with um, time loop movies, they kind of get a bit trapped in existential angst. Of what <laughs> yeah. it all means. But this is, oh, this is a time loop. This is really cool. What can we do with it? It's just so sweet, really. Where did you find it? I've been meaning to see that. Uh, I don't know if it's um, Region 3, but they do have a history of Region 3. But uh, the, the, the home video label, Third Window Films, have put out a version okay. of it. So, yeah, it's it's just really genuinely charming as all hell. Mm. And it's okay. only 70 minutes. Uh, James, you said you, you, you uh, shrieked into light when I said that name there. So have you seen that one too? Yeah, so I saw that at one of the film festivals I covered last year, and it was easily my favourite of that. It's such an inventive and really well put together and such a charming little film. And, and it, the idea that it's just... I don't know if it's stitched together or it's legitimately all filmed in one take, but it's just so inventive and mystifying how they got it all together. But it's wonderful filmmaking and it's and you compared it to One Cut of the Dead, but I believe the director of that film said it was a spiritual successor to it. Yeah, I can see that. A high yeah. watermark. It, it kind of feels like, I see what you did there with One Cut of the Dead. Allow me to just take it up a notch and see what you can really do with it. That one, one upsmanship. Mm. It's yeah, it's a strong recommend that one. It's just genuinely so much fun. And the 70 minutes is just super easy to watch. And just to be the, just to be the populist, um, to close out, uh, there's a new Pixar movie. I think it was on Friday, uh, turning red, which has had an interesting story around it. It's effectively about how a Canadian, Chinese, American girl, uh, is coming to terms with being a teenager and everything that entails. And it uses a metaphor of a turning into a big red panda. Oh, yes. I've seen like maybe the cover or like poster images of that with a panda like at a desk yeah. in school. It's very cute looking. Oh, it's incredibly cute. But it's just one of these movies, I think it it's doing the right thing. It's representing a type of person who hasn't, who isn't getting their stories told. 
and it does it in a very very charming and down to earth way, which is just full of it. It's made it uh, set in two thousand and two, and it's just very very charming and nostalgic about that era. But the reception to it, whew, it's just been bad. Really, I don't know. Have you seen any of this? Like um, critically, is it not? Oh, it's it's. Lots of straight white American critics saying this isn't a story oh, for me, well. so therefore it is bad. It's just, come on. It's a, it's a really charming, sweet movie about some charming, sweet, you know, teenage girls. And um, I think them story is just as worthy of being told than whatever they're doing in Star- Toy Story or the Cars movies. Mm. It's not awesome. Yeah. It's just a lovely little film. There's always going to be some people who just need to be quiet for a minute Mm -hmm. and understand when something isn't for it's not their turn to talk yeah yeah that's unfortunate it's just charming it's a lovely charming movie and i think it's probably the best that pixar have done in a about three or four i think oh personally speaking i know obviously as i as i mentioned opinions do diverge quite wildly on this one but yeah it's it's a nice one um, and also just the TV reference. I've been watching The Great North, and I just I've loved that entirely. That's a that's a fun TV show. I've not getting, seen that. Not seen that. From the makers of uh, well, one of the producers of Bob's Burgers, so it's it's that, it's that sort of thing. Okay. And it's got great little and um, songs over the credits. One uh, sort of a garage rock death metal about the uh, Sasquatch singing about uh, Peter Surprise. And you, you've got me. You've got me with that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, anything else that you want to bring up? Any I review? Are you both good on plugs and mentions? I'm um, okay. Okay, so I think uh, that draws a, a line in a show for a day. Um, Ariel, where can we where can we find you online? You can find me on Twitter at Ari underscore Hellraiser, and all my work will be posted there. Excellent. And James, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd at RoddersJ04, spelled with two Ds. And I write reviews for Moving Pictures Film Club and over at my site, thereviewingrodders.co.uk. So, yeah, check it out. And that's us for another episode. If you have any questions or comments on the films we covered or their makers, please, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at directorsuncutpod at gmail.com. That's directorsuncutpod at gmail.com this week i have been joined by graham williamson who you can find on the pop screen podcast you can get that wherever podcasts find you you can also read his writing on the geekshow.co.uk or horrified magazine Uh, and i've been rob simpson and that was directors uncut